Welcome to the Victory Broadcast. If this ministry has impacted you in any way, please consider supporting the spread of the gospel by visiting us online and choosing the giving option that works best for you. Now we pray that this message will stir your heart and build your faith. Get ready to receive the word of God. day is coming where we may not have the freedom that we enjoy right now to um, be able to gather without persecution or fear for our lives as they do in other countries and, and while we have this the right of Hebrews um, encourages us that we should do this all the more uh, especially as we see the day of Jesus Christ approaching I know it has been um, three weeks since we've been in this room, and I know that uh, some people in our community are sick, and people are, are COVID concerned, and, and there are many watching from home. And for those of you who are who are present in the room, I, I just it, it feels good to be in your presence. I am thankful for the opportunity we have to worship Jesus together. <clears throat> And for those of you who are, are watching at home, the Victory family and those online, um, we are thankful to have this opportunity to be in God's presence uh, together. Um, before I, we dive into the proclamation of God's word, I, I do want to just take a moment to shout out a, a, a family, uh, the Moncrief family that watches these gatherings um, in Arizona. And I want to give a special shout out to the 13-year-old young man um, who reached out to us via his family by email um, who let us know that your life is being impacted and your faith is being strengthened by what God is doing here in the city of Atlanta. And uh, young brother, I don't know your name, um, but uh, when you see this message, I just want to tell you thank you for your letter. I want to thank you that I am encouraged um, that a 13-year-old is, is watching these messages and being impacted. I am encouraged that somebody is listening. And uh, So shout out to you, young man, and shout out to you, the Moncrief family. I hope I didn't screw your name up, uh, who watches us faithfully every week in Arizona. Uh, thank you uh, for your faithful support of the gospel ministry here. And uh, for all those who are watching in cities around the country, we thank you uh, for your faithful support of gospel ministry. Um, uh, family, this is um, week one of I don't know how many weeks it's going to be. Um, it's going to be week one until I say there's no more weeks of um, our study uh, through one of the most um, powerful chapters in the New Testament in a sermon series that we have no sexy name for. We're just entitling Romans 12. Um, uh, next level you. Um, next level us. And, um, you know, I am just committed at this point, and I am just, just honestly, if I could, just praying that, that this series will mark some type of cataclysmic shift in you some kind of shift in us um, that, uh, that you won't just come in here looking to be entertained because I, I know that in this country we use the pulpit as a shopping window for talent we love for preachers to entertain us like so I've been done with that for a long time and that is definitely dead now as, as I feel the Holy Spirit urging me to keep you close to the Word of God. Because there is a time coming in this country of, of, of there is a time coming where you're going to need to stand on something other than the clever words of men. Right? We, you haven't seen trouble yet. And, and I believe that there is a wake up coming to this nation through suffering and persecution that will require you to have the word in you 
Because you're, you're not going to be able to up, up, up stand or stand up up against the weight of the cultural pressure off of the, the clever words of men. Yeah. And, and when I am gone, especially for my sons and my daughters, or, or when I'm no longer the pastor of Victory Church, I, I, and, and, and you don't have my voice in the middle of the night when you're going through trouble, you need to know how to search the scriptures for yourself. Yeah. Right? When, when, when you don't have my voice... You don't need from a, a point that I gave you in a message when you're in trouble. You need to know how to search the scriptures for yourself. And what I'm praying for you is that you would stop being impressed with talent on platforms. Whether in this church or whatever churches you're watching across the country, man, I'm praying for you to grow up from that garbage. That preachers don't have to work so hard. That you would be in awe of, not of my sermon, but you would be in awe of God's word. Yeah. That's what I want you to be in awe of. I want you to be in awe and wonder of God's word. Yeah. I want you to read it and be in awe. Yeah. I want you to hear it and be in awe. Yeah. I want you to not wait for a perfect outline to be in awe, but I want you to hear God's word read to you and be in awe. Jesus goes to his hometown and walks into a synagogue and says, hand me a scroll. He opens it to Isaiah chapter 61. He reads three verses. He says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hair and closes the scroll. Church service over. Yeah. See, but that's not enough for us as Americans. And, and I'm praying that even with the beginning of this series that something would shift in you. That you would grow as a person who just becomes in awe of wonder of God's holy word. The only thing he said is settled in heaven. The thing that he said, watch, he exalted above his own name. I noticed nobody shouted when I said we're doing a series called Romans 12. But if I said we were doing a series seven steps to be blessed... You would went crazy and ran around the room and did a backflip off your chair. But, but no excitement for just Romans 12. One person said amen. I got help from one person on the front row. See, see if I'm sitting in a chair, something in me is saying, God, give me all of your word. Every, everything in that chapter, I want all of that for me. No? No? Yes. Yes. So if you have your Bible or your phone or your app, we're going to camp out in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Is where our study is going to come from this morning. And here's your fancy title for the message, for the teaching through two verses sacrificed and transformed is what I'm believing will happen for you that you would be sacrificed and transformed nobody care how well you preach nobody care how well you sing or how well we play or how much church attendance you have or how good you sing nobody care about that that's not going to last in the judgment Nobody care about your profile and God first and woman of God. Nobody care about that. If it's disconnected from someone who's not sacrificed and transformed. Nobody might care about the songs you write or the sermons I preach if we're not sacrificed and transformed. Jesus doesn't care about that. The judgment is not going to care about that. And while these words, right, we, we, we don't like these words, but man, when we mature, we say, Lord, I want all of that. Amen. And so, Father, I pray over these sons and daughters in this room, watching across this camera, Spirit of God, that you would arouse a wonder. And in awe in the person and work of Jesus Christ. 
that these hearts would be moved towards a practical response that brings about transformation in their lives. And that is all. Drive out every demonic force and every hindrance. Every distraction and every worry. And let this seed fall on good ground and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. In the mighty name of Yahshua HaMashiach, the Lord, the anointed one. Those who receive that say amen. amen. Thank you, Frank. Um, sacrificed and transformed. Um, when, I, when I kneel to pray, I often use instrumental worship to help me sometimes walk into the presence of God. Recently, I have turned off my music and I've been kneeling down in God's presence, Rhonda, in utter silence. And, and kneeling down before him and not uttering a word of what I desire, but sitting there long enough to have glimpses in my mind of the throne room of heaven. And I sit in my room, in my prayer room, and I have glimpses of the presence of God in my room before me, the angelic beings around me, and I kneel there in quiet, and in this moment, this week, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there in quiet, meditating on the Lord before I utter any desire from my heart. And the Holy Spirit began to remind me of when I first began to kneel down and cried out to God. It was in 2003 in a bathroom in silence and suicidal thoughts where I bent my knee over a toilet not to throw up from alcohol the night before but to earl from the emptiness of my life. And not empty because I was broke or not empty because I didn't have things going. Beautiful girlfriend. Luxury car. Nice apartment. Small. Friends. Connected. Popular in my city. Empty. Suicidal. Six months prior. Alcohol. Shotgun. Don't have the courage to pull the trigger. Got to get drunk enough to pull the trigger. Go into the bathroom. Kneel over the toilet. Is this God real? You need to reveal yourself to me. I'm not leaving this bathroom unless you reveal yourself to me. And I cry and I cry and I cry until the God of heaven meets me in that bathroom. Tears of emptiness turns to tears of awe as a presence fills the room and engulfs every square inch of that small bathroom. My heart for the first time is burned. Something inside me is stirred. I'm not recognizing that the Holy Spirit is filling me now. God has then unzipped me and zipped me back up with the Holy Spirit. I start to look over my life and feel bad about my sin. For the very first time, I feel disgusted with my sin. And I stay there and I weep and I weep and I weep and I cry for hours and I come out of that bathroom and I tell Lena something has happened to me in this bathroom. I'm sleeping on the couch. I don't want to be in a room with Lena. I'm trying to figure out what has really transpired in my heart. I, I don't have any language for it. I can't articulate what has happened in my heart. I don't have any Bible for it, but I understand that something has happened to me in this bathroom. Something supernatural has transpired in my heart. I take my little crazy dog, who I hated that dog. His name was Isaac, uh, uh, a Dotson who was evil and wicked and full of Satan. And I take that evil, wicked dog for a walk the next day, and I go outside, and I feel for the first time 
joy. For the first time, I feel no worry about anything. I'm not worried about bills. I'm not worried about job. I'm walking the dog, and for the first time, I'm looking at the trees and saying, a creator put these here. And I'm looking at the sky, and I said, a creator put that there. I'm looking at clouds that we take for granted and said, a creator painted that sky. I'm feeling the wind blowing on my face. I'm feeling, man, this feels like God brushing me on my face. And for the first time, my human faculties is sensitive to the presence of God. The scripture says, man, that all of creation sings and testifies about his presence, that it testifies that there is a creative designer. That even if a man was in a bush in Africa and considered all of creation, something would tell him in his conscience, his conscience, his C-O-N science, his with knowledge, that there is an intelligent designer. And for the first time in my life, I'm walking around in awe that there is a being that has created all of this. And my heart now for the first time is in wonder of a God that my parents was telling me about for years but the street had a hold of my heart. The next day, a man walks up to me and puts a King James Bible in my hand. He says, if you want to know God, you have to know this book. And I begin to open the scriptures. I begin to read the scriptures for the first time, and on every page, I'm bumping into the voice and the presence of God. He's He's speaking to me from his word. I remember the first time I was reading this word alone, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge me. I promise, Philip, I will direct your path. And I'm, I'm hearing the Lord talking to me from the pages of the Bible. And now something I had been reading as a little boy with no understanding, the Holy Spirit is giving me revelation as a personal teacher with no pastor. No coach, no choir, no podcast, no leadership podcast. The Lord, the Holy Spirit of God is talking to me for the first time from his word. I learned that the pages of the Bible, they are alive and active. And as I'm reading the word, it's reading me. As I'm searching the word, it's searching me. As I'm examining the word, it's examining me. And for the first time, I look into a different mirror. And saying, Lord, I'm nasty here. And Lord, I'm not right there. And Lord, my mouth is foul here. Lord, my sexual sin stinks here. Lord, my attitude is bad here. Lord, I need to forgive here. Lord, I need to love here. Lord, I need to change here. It was around that time the movie, The Passion of the Christ, came out. I remember Lena and I went to sit down to watch The Passion of the Christ And for the first time, Mel Gibson, who was persecuted by the Jews, created for us almost a perfect depiction of the brutal mutilation of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ upon a cross for you and for me. And as I watched the movie, reading the subtitles from the Hebrew language, I could not understand. The whole time, I'm weeping for two hours while I'm in this movie. By the time the Lord's arm is stretched out with anger and a nail goes through his hand and through his feet, from the time he cries out, it is finished. I walk out the movies, I don't speak for days because my heart now has been broken by what the Lord had done for me. For the first time, I see with my eyes what I had read in the word, is this what Jesus suffered for me? That they beat him and within an inch of his life that according to Isaiah, his face was not recognizable. Thinking Pilate thought this would be enough to satisfy these people. But after they had beat him within an inch of his life, no, it was not enough. Now we must nail him to a cross when we can't even recognize his face. Yeah. And then... I started reading about heaven and hell, studying Daniel. I'm reading this book, thinking that there's a place for people who die who have rejected the gospel. And then I start having flashbacks in my mind of all the times I I drove home from clubs drunk under the banner of grace from one I did not know. I started thinking about all the bullets 
that flew by me and didn't hit me in the back of my head as I was living under the banner of the grace of a person I did not know. I thought about all the beds I was hopping in and out of and didn't die from a disease as I was living under the banner of the grace of a person I did not know. I thought about all the times my life was in danger, all the times I was living every day dangling over the fires of hell, just one breath away, one accident away, one bottle away, one car crash away, one wrong sexual encounter away, one fight, one gun fight, one knife fight. I kept thinking about all the times every day for years I was just dangling over the fires of hell, one breath from damnation, not knowing the only thing waking me up the next morning in my sin was the grace of a loving God I did not know. As every morning I woke up in sin, I was dangling over the fires of eternal damnation. If I would have died before November 2003, I would be eternally separated from God to this day, crying for my family not to come here. And the only thing waking me up the next morning while I was still ratchet and in my sin was the grace of a God that was keeping me, who I did not know. And the more I look back over the grace that was keeping me in my sin, the more I thought about what Jesus did on the cross, the more I thought about how me, a wretched, foul, vile woman abuser, drug dope selling from 12 years old, the families are ruined, the lives are ruined, the women are ruined, the, the armed robberies are performed. And the more I thought about all of my evils, and he kept letting me wake up, the more, man, I was saying to myself, how do I respond to that type of grace? The more I started thinking about that level of grace, the more with no preacher, nobody got to force me or convince me, the more my heart wanted to be holy wanted to please him wanted to be generous wanted to tell others about him the more I kept reflecting on what I was what he did what he gave me the more my heart was desiring to live right for him it was a natural desire with no pressure no coercion no manipulation I just kept saying I hate my sin I want to live right. I can't keep having sex outside of marriage. I want to live right. I can't keep cursing people out. I want to change my mouth. I can't keep holding people. I want to forgive. I can't keep being evil. I want to do right. I can't keep slandering people I don't like. I got to start praying for them. I can't keep doing wickedness back to people who do me wickedness. I got to pray for these crazy people day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. I just desire to want to do right. Because something inside me was like, for all he has done, man, I want him to look at me and just be pleased. <clears throat> Not out of a false sense of obligation, but out of glad submission, joyful surrender. I want him to look at me and say, man, this is a good son. Just this natural response of gratitude to grace. Has anybody ever felt that? Just a natural response of gratitude to watch unmerited grace. Could not earn it. Wasn't moral enough for it. Didn't have enough church attendance to get it. Didn't understand enough Bible to know it. Didn't give enough offerings to buy it. Totally undeserved. Especially for a person like me, no way, God. No way. Surely you wasted those nails dying for a person like me. I would not die for a person like me. You don't know what I used to be. I would not have died for a person like me. Some of you know you. You would not die for a person like you.
And it is this sentiment that Paul has in his heart when he sits down to pen the letter of Romans to this church that he had never visited before. He's in the ancient city of Corinth. He hears about a church in Rome that's growing. A church that was founded by Jews who was in the gathering on the day of Pentecost, listening to Peter preach, filled with the Holy Spirit, travels back to Rome, founds a church in Rome full of Jews, Gentiles, non-Jewish people who are full of tension with their Jewish brothers, Jewish men hanging on to Old Testament laws and man-made traditions. My grandmama taught me can't wear a skirt, don't wear earrings, tattoos, you're going to hell. Hanging on to all these traditions, trying to fulfill the Ten Commandments that you can't keep anyway. With non-Jewish believers who got tension because they're too liberal, they're too free, they don't know our laws, they don't know our morals. Y'all are ratchet Christians, we are righteous Christians, and we're fighting in the same church. Paul hears about this church in Rome that he had never visited before, watch never been there desiring one day to go to Rome he hears about that church he loves that church so much he would even say I would give my own salvation for all of them to be truly saved I will exchange my own righteousness for all of them to be truly saved he sits down he takes pen and pad and he writes to the church in Rome he introduces himself as the apostle And for 11, listen to me, 11 chapters, he unloads on them about everything I experienced that I just explained to you. He talks to them about the utter depravity of human beings. I don't know what that means. I was born on the altar in church. You were born dead, a sinner separated from God because of the nastiness of your flesh. No, I'm a good person. No, the Bible says no one is good. You are a foul person. The Bible says all of your goodness is as a filthy rag, i.e. a period cloth. Your behavior is no better in God's sight than a dirty tampon. And he talks to them about the depravity of human beings, that all men are born separated from God, already in danger of damnation. He talks to them about people who ignore the conscience, seal themselves with an iron. He talks about people who strays from God, who loves evil, who God turns over. He talks about salvation and baptism into Christ. He talks about what Jesus did on the cross. He exalts the person of Christ, the work of Christ, the cross of Christ, the teachings of Christ. He exalts Christ. He gets to verses 6, 7, and 8 and talks about the power of the gospel, the only message with divine power strong enough to snatch an unbelieving person, unzip them from their unrighteousness, zip them up from the Holy Spirit, and make them right in the sight of God. No message on earth has the power to do that. Not an Islamic message or a Buddhic message or a Hindu message. Only the gospel message has inside of it divine power to transform a sinful person and yank them from darkness and hurl them into the light. Not because of moralism or good behavior, but because of the power of a work you could not accomplish on your own. I was a Muslim for a season, praying five times a day, not eating pork, when I love pork fried rice and chicken wings from Chinese restaurant all these rules and regulations trying to earn the approval of a deity who I did not know when I would do enough to be loved by him. (sighs) Trying to earn love from a deity that gave me rules and regulations in the Quran and not knowing how much do I have to do to finally be accepted, not so in the gospel. That was made right not because of my behavior. I was made right because of the work of Christ upon the cross. That I don't have to work for something that is freely given. No message on earth is more powerful than the gospel message. And he teaches them about the gospel message, 6, 7, and 8. He gets to 10, talks about the feet of those who go to spread the good news of the gospel. How blessed 
are those feet. These Air Jordans are blessed because these feet are spreading the gospel. That I don't need to wear wingtips to be holy. I'm set apart by the power of Christ that is alive on the inside of me. And then as he goes through Romans, he'll say stuff to them like this. And you've heard these things before. If you've ever read through the book of Romans, in first chapter 1 through 11, he'll say things to you like, God saved you. You'll bump into that in Romans. God redeemed you. You'll bump into that in Romans. God regenerated you, made you alive by the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll bump into that in Romans. God justified you. That is, took away the life sentence that you were supposed to get like Ahmad or Barry Killers. Removed the life sentence and said, now you're free as if you never sinned in my entire sight. Justified you. God made Christ a propitiation for you. Took your place in death and damnation. God raised you up. God removed condemnation for you. You know Romans chapter 8, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm in Romans 8. Let me keep going all the way through 11. God is for you. You heard this in Romans 4. If God be for you, who can be against you? He said God is for you, that you got heavenly backup all the time. He said in Romans, the Holy Spirit prays for you. <laughs> when you don't know what to pray you can worry that somebody is praying for you all the time he said the Holy Spirit prays for you he says now God causes all things to work together for the good for you he says God through the death of Christ demonstrated his love for you watch. he spends 11 chapters unloading all of that and watch what he says Watch. And because God done all of that for you, 11 chapters of doctrine, he pivots to chapter 12, practicality. And he cries out to you with these verses. Because God did all of that for you, let's pivot. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Because of all of that, I appeal to you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I am begging you by the mercies of God the argument I just laid out for 11 chapters because of all God has done here is how you should respond to him present your bodies it's not yours to do what you want with it because all he has done for you you have been purchased so because you have been bought and because I did all of that for you, says the Lord, now present to me your body. I want your body, not your lip service, not your posts. I want your body, not your fake behavior in church. I want your Monday to Saturday. I want your body. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. And he says, which is and cannot escape your spiritual. Another translation says your reasonable acts of service. It is your spiritual worship. Look what Paul says. Let's unpack the text. This is the ESV. I love the ESV in the New King James. Hardcore Bible teaching. He says, I appeal to you. Watch this. Therefore. The word therefore is a conjunction that joins what I'm about to tell you with a previous thought. This word, therefore, anchors everything Paul was talking about in chapters 1 through 11. What was he doing in chapters 1 through 11, Frank? He was unpacking the gospel message of salvation. Watch. He was unpacking how you was lost in sin. He was unpacking the work of Jesus Christ for you upon the cross. He was unpacking the fact that without Christ, you are already an object of God's wrath. He was unpacking how every day you lived as an object of God's wrath, one breath away from damnation, but Christ saved you, redeemed you, raised you up, reconciled you. He says, therefore, because of everything I was doing, listen, present your body. So Paul, watch, anchors 11 chapters of theology 
to the appeal to present your body as a living sacrifice. Watch what Paul does. He anchors your reason for right living to theology. This is powerful. He anchors your response to God for right living to everything God did. We don't hear that in the American church. No, no, no. Let, let, me, let me tell you what you hear in the American church. You're awesome. You're wonderful. You're a bag of chips. We know you fearfully and wonderfully made. If you live right, God will bless you. If you live right, he'll give you what you believe in for. Man, you need to be holy so that you can be blessed. This is such heresy. You need to be holy so you can be blessed. You need to live right so you can be blessed. You need to pray a certain amount of time so you can be blessed. You need to do X, Y, Z, Z. And we keep anchoring good behavior to blessing. The heresy and the fallacy in that is, what if I am good and I still don't get it? You know what that sets me up for? Disappointment, disillusionment, and my lack of desire for God. So when he doesn't answer my prayer, when I'm still single and I'm 40, when I don't have the house that I want, he did not move in my career, a relative died of something I was praying that they would be healed for, watch, we get disappointed with God because we keep teaching people that good behavior brings blessing. And then when he doesn't come through, we turn away from him. We never see Paul doing that. That is American preaching. That's not Bible preaching. We never see Paul anchoring your response to God based on things that you want from him. Paul is always anchoring our right response to God based on what he has already done for you. Read the New Testament. You never see Paul anchoring good behavior for what God. It's always, this is what Christ has done. Now you should respond. Yeah. He, he, read the letter to the Ephesians. He spends four chapters telling them what God has done, and then he pivots and says, therefore. Yeah. First and second Thessalonians, what God has done, therefore. Colossians, what God has done, therefore. Paul is so wise, so articulate, so intelligent, every time he writes a letter, he tells them what Christ has done first. Then he says, because of that, this is how you should respond to God. You know why that don't work in America? Because you're bored with the cross. That's why it doesn't work in America, because American Christians are bored with the cross. Heard the cross story, get my Easter outfit, We don't really lean into what Jesus accomplished for us there. We get prideful in our hearts. We get snooty. We get churchy. We get religious. We we start we start getting lifted because of our talents. We forget we forget about what Jesus did. Listen, some of us been in church so long, you forgot you was a wretched wrath object of God. So watch. So because you're bored with the work of Christ on the cross, that's not strong enough to move you to good behavior. That's American preaching. That's not gospel preaching because Paul did not preach like that. In fact, Paul said, if anyone preaches any other gospel than the one I preach, I don't care how big they following is, let that person be damned. So Paul said, any other gospel, prosperity gospel, good works gospel, Jesus plus God, any other gospel, then Christ came, Christ lived, Christ died, Christ raised, Christ ascended, Christ teaching, let him be damned. See? And because we forget what we was rescued from, we get so prideful, we feel like, watch, we deserved salvation. And so in our self-entitlement, we will, we will stare at the work of Christ on the cross, turn away from the cross and say, no. I will not follow. You owe me what I want anyway. No, I will not sacrifice, but you owe me what I'm praying for anyway. No, I will not be generous, but you owe me this prayer anyway. No, I will not sacrifice my life for you, but you owe me this anyway. We look at Christ, what he did on the cross, we turn away and we say no. Can you imagine being like the McMichaels who was just sentenced to life in prison. Imagine you about to be 35 years old, about to do life in prison, 
And just before they cuff you and carry you away, a man walks in and says, Judge, hold on one second. This young dude, McMichael is 35, I will do his sentence for him. Let him go free. How do you walk out of that courtroom and not write letters of gratitude back to that person? How, how do you do that? What kind of person does that? A person who hasn't been taught. A person who hasn't been renewed. A person who hasn't been transformed. A person who's self-entitled. An American Christian does that. How do you walk away from a life sentence and not turn around to, be grad to show gratitude? How is that possible? That's American preaching. Self-help, 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 and all that produces is, watch, consumerism, consumerism, consumerism. Pull up to the kingdom. Let me order what I want from God, like I'm at McDonald's. No, we should be here and follow Jesus, follow Jesus, follow Jesus to produce self-sacrificing Christians that pull up to the kingdom and say, Lord, what can I do for you? You know what this looks like? It looks like Isaiah in chapter 6 who says, in the year King Uzziah died, in the year something died that was blocking my vision, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His throne filled the temple. Angels was flying around him and they got a glimpse of his side and they cried holy. They got a glimpse of his back and they cried holy. They got a glimpse of his side and they cried holy. And as they cried holy, man, the building shook because of their voice. And then he saw the holiness of God and said, oh snap, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live amongst the people of unclean lips. God looks at him as he's writhing in his sin, sends a coal from the altar, redeems him. His only response is he hears the counsel of heaven. Now, who can I send for me? Isaiah knows that he was a sinner saved. He says, here am I, offering, send me. That is the right response to grace. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. This language would provoke in people who knew he's writing to Jews. They were accustomed to bringing animals alive, killing them on the side of the altar, throwing their whole bodies in the fire and watching them burn. So they was accustomed to doing this. So when they hear, present your bodies a living sacrifice, like, look, you want us to throw our bodies in the fire? No, no, no. You are now a living sacrifice. Paul, I don't get it. I want you to kill yourself daily. Die to selfishness daily. Die to unforgiveness daily. Die to being stingy daily. Die to slander daily. Die to sexual sin daily. Die to all these things. I want you to keep putting yourself on the altar. I want you to live as a dying person. I want you to be a living, breathing martyr. You put your heart on that altar. You put your will on that altar. Lord, I want, but I don't want. Lord, I surrender. That's dying. Lord, I want, the Lord says, I don't want that from you. I put that on the altar. That's dying. I want you to give this to this brother and sister. No, but I bought this. Give it. Okay, Lord, that's dying. I want you to be a living sacrifice. That is, I want you to keep dying daily. Watch, to all the things that are antithetical to my word and my perfect will. Watch, for you. He said, well, how come they get to do it, but it's not my will for you? How come they got married, but it's not my will yet for you? How come they get to it, but it's not my will yet for you? But this is what I want. Kill that. But they hurt me. I want to hold them. Kill that. I love gossip and slandering people who I don't want to know. Kill that. I don't feel like praying. Kill that. I don't want to serve. I don't want to give. I don't want to be faithful. I don't want to love. Killed all of that. Man, he, he, oh, he does me so good. Yeah. Kill that. But God, you want me to keep my legs closed? Yeah. Kill that. Now, but it's only right that we drive the car before we get married. No, 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 no. Kill that. So he can't get in my cookie jar? Yeah. Put a lid on that. But what if he leaves me? Sacrifice him. Jesus. 
That's your response to the cross. They hurt me. If I could forgive you for all you've done, sacrifice your right to keep them. Let them go. But Lord, you don't know what they did. Kill that. So what is the motivation for that? The 11 chapters of everything I've done for you is your motivation. Not because I'm going to bless you. Not because I'm going to give you this house. Not be, what is my motivation for doing that? The 11 chapters of what I did for you, kill that. You nasty in this area, kill it. Oh, you, you full of lust, turn your head, bounce your eyes, keep killing it until it can't overpower you. Kill it. I want to be known. I want you to be in the dark for a, little, for a season. Kill that. I want to be famous. I want to be an influencer. No, I want you to be in obscurity and pray. Kill it. I want to build this business. I want you to put that on the shelf and serve this faithfully. Kill that. I want to be this. No, I want you to serve this man of God faithfully. Kill it. See, it's easy to post. This is Christianity. All that Insta sham, that ain't Christianity. You be impressed with titles and Insta sham. I'm impressed with character and sacrifice. I ain't impressed by people's following. I'm not impressed by the money. I'm impressed by character and sacrifice. My wife says all the time, honey, don't be impressed by them. She said that to me for years. Just check their fruit. I'm looking for apples and oranges falling off the tree. Got trees with 300,000 people following you and no fruit. He said you should do that by watch. The mercies of God. And what will God do with a body that's presented to him? Look right at me. Look, look, look right, watch. Listen to this body. How about that? You want proof? What will God do with a body that's presented to him, that's being sacrificed and dying daily? He will purify it. He will prune it. He will mature it. He will break it. He will bless it. He will give it. History is replete from the scriptures to people sitting in this room of the power of God of what he would do with any life that's totally presented to him. Some of you think, I don't have nothing to give. You have yourself to give. I'm not talented. I can't sing. I can't preach like pastor. I can't. No, no. He said, just give me you and watch what I do with you. But I got insecurities. I feel shame. I got issues. I got, I didn't ask you. Just, just present you. Just throw all of your life, your mouth, your heart, your body. Just throw all of you on the altar and watch what I do with that sacrifice. God does amazing things with sacrificed people. Every person you admire who's done anything great in the kingdom was a sacrificed person. He says, this is your spiritual act of worship. I'm almost done. Watch. He said, this is your spiritual act of worship. Wait a second. Sacrificing myself daily is worship? I thought worship was the song we sung before you preached, Pastor. In a narrow sense, worship is adoration and praise, but now we learn something else, that the true dynamics of worship is not only a song or an act of homage. Worship, watch, is a life that I live. It is a soundtrack that is pleasing to God. Worship happens on Monday. It happens on Saturday. Worship happens when I'm at my job. It happens when somebody cuss me out and I don't cuss them back. Worship happens when they throw the finger at me in traffic and I don't honk my horn at them pray for Philip. I ain't worshiping on that level yet. I fight. I want to fight people that throw the finger up at me. I'm, I'm being honest. I, I'm not there yet. A, a lady flicked me off the other day. I followed her for like three miles. I said, Philip, you are a preacher in the city. You can't do stuff like that. I had to turn away. The Holy Spirit had to punch me in my heart. You've been following this woman for, following this woman for miles. What was you thinking you was going to do? Follow her to her driveway, pull out the gun in your car? What was you going to do, Philip? The Holy Spirit is talking to me while I'm following her. Pray for me. 
true story. I followed her for a long time while the Holy Spirit is talking to me. Radio off, Holy Spirit talking, I'm still following this woman. I want to break that finger. I don't want to tell you what I did when I caught her. Let me confess. She got jammed at a light. I pulled up on, I put my window down. I told her, put your window down. I looked in that car, I said, you better watch who you talk to like that. The wrong person will take your life. And I speed off beeping my horn for like three minutes. True story. Why do I tell you that? Because I'm still a work in progress too. I still need prayer too. I'm still being sanctified too. I'm still dying daily too. Ain't no perfect person on the altar. <laughs> let's, let's finish. If verse 1 tells you that you should sacrifice yourself, that this is your spiritual worship, if verse 1 tells you that you should be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing and acceptable to God, that you should live every day dying to all of the nastiness in you and to everything you read in the Word that troubles you. You should, be, you should willfully keep dying. You should say to yourself, I know this is wrong, and kill it. That's hard. Oh, gosh, I want to... Mm, I shouldn't have talked to them like that. I owe them an apology, but oh, kill it. If he's telling you to do that, I, I, I read. I'm like, how do I do that? Because in my natural flesh, I can't do that. So if verse 1 is, this is what you must do, verse 2 gives you two pathways to doing that. Then he pivots from verse 1 to verse 2. I'm about to finish. He says, this is how you do that. Do not be conformed. The Bible is so powerful. It's going to make sense to you. Verse 1 and one, verse 2. Watch how they connect. If you're going to sacrifice, if you do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind because where your mind is is where your heart is, is where your decisions are, is where your actions are. When your mind is renewed, you don't follow people for three miles who gave you the finger. <laughs> that by testing, you may discern what the will of God is. The will of God was for me to forgive her and drive away. And knowing that the will of God is what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me unpack this and then I'm going to close. He says, do not be conformed to the pattern or do not be conformed to this world. Now, we take this and we crucify the world. Oh, the world, the world, the world, but we're supposed to be in the world. This word world in Greek means age. It talks about time, culture, yeah. the period of time in which the reader lives. So what he's saying is, do not be conformed. Don't be pressed into the mold of the times that you're living in. Yeah. Now, this is going to make sense to you. You said, but now watch. I love the times. I love the world. I love Kanye. I, I love Yeezys. I love all this stuff. Yeah, I, 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 a pair of Yeezys is dope. I got on some Jordans. Like, yo, my, I, I'll go to a comedy club. I like Aretha Franklin. Man, I listened to Sade the other day, and you ain't going to make me feel guilty about it. So he's not talking about all that religious stuff that we think is worldly. On, he said, don't be conformed, or watch, to the age, to the spirits of the age, the patterns, the, the nonsense of the age. He said, don't be conformed to that. What? Because in this age, there's no shortage of things for you to conform to, like vanity, like materialism, yeah. like greed, like jealousy like comparison you keep thumbing your, your thumb is strong and your soul is weak man I don't have a marriage like them man I don't have a ministry like them I don't have a car like them I don't have a dislike them you got a strong thumb and a weak soul he said don't be pressed or boxed into the mold of the age the times, don't force yourself to go downstream yeah. with the times. The narcissism of the times, 
the materialism of the times, the ungodliness of the times. Why should I not conform to the times? Why? Because Paul taught you something about the times. He said the times we are living in, they are, watch this word, evil. He said in Ephesians that the times we're living in, they are evil. He said to the churches in Galatia that the times we are living in, they are evil. So he said, don't be conformed to this age. Don't have the mindset, the attitudes, the desires, the unbridled ambitions of the times. Why? Because if you conform to the times, you lose your distinctiveness as a follower of God. He's telling you, you should stand out from the times. Everybody is hoeing at my school. I'm going to hold it down. Everybody is jealous of everybody. I'm going to be content. Everybody is trolling everybody. I'm going to pray for my enemy. He said, don't be pressed or boxed into the mold of the age of the times. Why? Because if you become just like the times, we can't see Jesus in the earth. Your unbelieving family can't see him. He's in a body in heaven. They have to look to his body, his neck down, the church. If we are no different than the times, how would they see any distinctiveness in the earth? That means Jesus is saying you must be watched distinct in the earth. You lose your fragrance when you conform to the times. You become as stink as the evilness of the times. You smell like body odor. You need the perfume of God's word and the perfume of the Holy Spirit to make you a different odor in the times. That when the room is, smells like nasty, evil, backfighting, I walk and I smell like a fragrance of love. When the world is promoting themselves on social media, every picture is an anus, a cleavage, a waist. Every picture is trying to lure some man into lust. I got on something nice, and I smell different than the times. I am a P31 woman in the times. I am a man of God in the times. I am a, listen, I'm an Ephesians 5, 6 man in the times. I smell different. Watch, you keep your distinctiveness. Um, let me read you something real quick. It's not, it's not going to come up on the screen. You love the times. I'm almost done. You want to go home. Uh, this is how Paul described these times. Uh, Second Timothy, the last thing he ever wrote in his life before he was executed. Paul wrote this before he was executed in Rome to a young man who was a pastor of a church in Ephesus. In Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he says, but understanding this, that in the last days... There will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of themselves. Yeah, you see all that narcissism on social media. Everything is about you. They will be lovers of money. Proud. Arrogant. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Listen, Malachi, Israel, Abigail, and Josiah. Ungrateful. Can't show gratitude. I hate when people can't say thank you. Why do you take and not say thank you? That is, a, that, is a, that is a character problem to receive and not say thank you. Watch. They will be heartless, unholy, unpleasable. Nothing pleases them. Got to have every iPhone and you still come up empty. Nothing pleases you. Slanderous, always got to troll somebody without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than loves of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying the power thereof, avoid such people. That, that's the times that we're living in. Now watch, why do you want to conform to that? Uh, let me finish. Watch. Let me, let me wrap this up. And watch, Paul is so smart. He says, don't even not conform, but then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Pastor, I don't get it. He's saying it's not enough to reject the times because your rejection of times is still not going to transform you. You will still be nasty while you're rejecting the times. You must reject the times, but then the transformation God wants must happen within. How are you transform within? By what happens in your mind. So he says, now your mind has to be renewed. But who is Paul talking to? He's talking to Christians. Amen. That is, when you were saved, you were saved in your soul, made alive by the Holy Spirit, but your thoughts was not saved. Amen. 
Because now that your body, your body has been saved, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, now that mind, your, the seat of your will and your emotions and your will now, all of that, now that has to be renewed over a course of time. The way you think, the way you perceive, the way you see the world. Watch, the things people taught you that were wrong. You believe things that the Bible don't teach. The Bible, the scriptures will say one thing, you believe another thing, and you will fight with the word of God. Your mind has to be renewed. The word will say forgive, and you will say no. The word will say generous, you will say no. The word will say serve, you would say no. The word will say be uh, uh, honor God, you would say no. The word will say give double honor to the ones whose job it is to teach and preach, you would say no. See, all of these things we have to be renewed in our mind. We got to be transformed in our mind. Watch. I'm going to finish. This Greek word where it says transform is the word where we get our English word metamorphism. That is, once I am renewed, I can, I'm not going back to what I used to be. I've been completely made into a brand new man, a brand new woman. This word in the Greek also speaks of, watch this, maturity. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, almost done. It speaks of maturity. You know someone has been renewed in their mind when you watch how mature they are. Maturity is the tangible evidence of a renewed mind. That's why you could, be in, you could be in Christ for 20 years and still be immature. Your mind has not been, you heard a lot of sermons. Yeah. You've done a lot of church. You have not been transformed in your mind. Watch. How do you be transformed in your mind? It's the constant deconstruction of bad thoughts and the setting up of God's thoughts. It's the tearing down, the removal of bad thoughts, and the setting up of right thoughts. It's why the scripture says, set your mind on things above. Yeah. It is thinking about eternity to govern how I live now. Yeah. It is me thinking that this is not my reward. The next life is my reward. It's me trying not to build utopia here. It's me leaning into my moments. It's me loving my wife, honoring my kids, enjoying Frank. Shout out to this person, showing love. It's me living in such a way that I will be rewarded later. That's not sexy, though. It's removing and replacing. It's purifying thoughts and beliefs. It's the willingness to allow the God's word to reign on my life. It's like I'm facing difficulty. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Look, I'm facing difficulty. Watch. I'm facing difficulty. And instead of dying in anxiety, I, I, I pray, I release, I trust God, and I walk in his peace. Philippians 4. That's the renewal of my mind. No, stop, Frank. Let me say one more thing. He says, as your mind is renewed, and it must be renewed by the word of God, look right at me. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Look right at me. You, you can't renew your mind by articles on Google. And you can't renew your mind by everything you see on Instagram. I, I, I know you're not going to hear what I got to say. Watch, watch. The more... This is the only way to renew your mind. This is why you should want to read it. And if you don't like reading, listen to it. And if you don't like to listen, at least be in a church where it's being taught. Why is this important? Everybody look right at me. Look, 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 look right at me. Why is this important? Look right at me. How many times have you been in a jam? Watch this. Look, look at me. How many times have you been in a jam Watch this. And trying to figure out what is God's will. Yeah. How, many, how many times have you had opportunities and trying to figure out which one should I take? Yeah. Should I move? Should I stay? Should I take the job or not? Should I break up with this person or not? How, how many, how, let's be honest, how many times have you said to yourself, I wonder what God's will is? Yeah. Who's ever said that to yourself? If, you're not, if your hand is not raised, you're probably lying. <laughs> I'm, I'm, watch. He said, but the more your mind is renewed, the easier it is for you to then discern. Amen. I have so much word in me, I look at this and I realize this cannot be God's will. Why? Because his will would never say anything that's opposite of the scriptures. And the more my mind is renewed, the more I keep coming up to decisions yeah. and sense inside me, this is good. Yeah. This is acceptable. This is perfect. 
Let me take a step of faith that this is God's will. Now I'm done. And think about how often you need to know God's will. You know why so many of you run around don't know God's will? Because our minds are not being renewed. So you want a personal prophet, but you have the word of God. Why are you sending money to a prophet? How stupid is that? You're going to buy a prophetic word? I know a preacher right now, won't call his name. You can buy him for $2,500 a year, and he will be your personal prophet. How evil and wicked and heretical is that? Your money perish with you, brother. You know why we're running around crazy? Because we don't have clarity. Because our minds are not being renewed. Our minds is full of Instagram. Full of everybody's blog. How many books do we consume and don't open the word? We're full of all these men's ideas and concepts, but we're not full of God's word. It's why we're so confused with our clarity. I ain't confused. I know who I am, whose I am, and what I'm supposed to be doing and what's coming for me when I die. I know what matters most in the times that I'm living in. And it's not trying to be famous or trying to keep up with so-and-so. It's being faithful to my calling whether they know my name or not. Don't clap for me. I want you to clap for you. I want you to know God's will. I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar. I want you to be able to test what God's will is. I want you to have a renewed mind. It changed your life. It'll change your life. Listen to me. I'm closing. Listen to me, please. Hear my heart. Look right at me. When I was first saved, one of the most important things I did to not even realize the impact was I sat down with the book of Revelation and I studied the whole thing in depth for months. Not understanding what that was going to do for me. Listen. John, on a prison island for preaching the gospel, Jesus appears to him, watch, and tells him, write down all these things that's going to happen in the end. Watch. The Lord does not even hide from humanity what's going to happen to everybody. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is crazy to me. He doesn't even leave it a secret. He doesn't sweep it on the rug. He tells all of humanity, the wicked are going to burn in the lake of fire. And the righteous are going to inherit rewards and judgment and a life eternal. Watch. In the new heaven and the new earth. Watch. A new world. Where we will have sky and trees and water. But with no pain, no sorrow, no sin, no sickness, no age, no Botox. Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. And everyone who died in Christ will reign with him. Watch. Forever. Let me ask you a question. Look right at me. If God, I'm closing, look right at me. If God Almighty went through great lengths to preserve these scriptures for thousands of years, through wars, the burning of Bibles, the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, if he worked so hard to make sure you would have it, just so you would have knowledge of the end, knowledge of judgment, knowledge of damnation, knowledge of hell, knowledge of heaven, knowledge of rewards, knowledge of a new world, I got a question for you. What sense does it make for any Christian with knowledge of a new world to be conformed to a world that is perishing? No, 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 no. I can't let you leave. I need to ask you this again until it gets in your heart. I want everyone in this room to listen to me carefully. Look right at me. I'm talking to you. Look, I'm talking to you. Look right at me. I want you to wrestle this question to the ground this week in your own heart. I had to deal with this this week. What sense does it make for a Christian who has knowledge of a world that is coming to be conformed to a world that is perishing? 
Let me say it one more time before I let you go. What, it is so foolish, what sense does it make to have knowledge of a world that is coming to give your life over to conformity to a world God said is going to perish all of its ways. My brothers and sisters, look right. This is akin to signing up to being a character in a puppet show and thinking the puppet show is real. How stupid is that? No, those clothes got to come off the puppet. The puppet show ends and then reality sets in. Why are you telling us that, Pastor? I want you to dump through Instagram and say, man, this is a puppet show. It's going to set some of y'all free. All this stuff I'd be jealous of, this is a puppet show. Jealous of evil people who are flourishing, this is a puppet show. All this abuse of women, this is a puppet show. Pornography, puppet show. All these things I think I want to, this this whole thing, this is a puppet show. It's going to end. Why would I conform to that? Why would I not live different than the puppet show? What sense does that make? When I look at the puppet show, I want to be on the altar. I want my mind renewed. I want to be different. I want to speak like God is talking through me. I want to love my wife, love that girl well. I want to have sex with her well. I want to forgive her well. I want to love my children well. I want to enjoy my brothers and sisters well. I want to preach this gospel well. I want to forgive well. I want to stand out well. I'm not going to go downstream with this puppet show. It's fake and it's going to come to an end because Jesus said it's perishing. Why are you signing up for that instead of signing up for this? The only thing that's going to outlast the puppet show. The only values and principles that's going to outlast this puppet show. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, what he has done for you, to present your bodies in this puppet show a living sacrifice, holy, separated, acceptable, and pleasing unto God. This is your spiritual act of a lifestyle of worship. Do not be conformed to this puppet show, the times that are evil. Instead, be transformed, be made new by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to know, test, prove, discern in every season what is God's will, his perfect, good, and acceptable will that keeps you distinct from going downstream with the puppet show. That is my prayer for you. Eternal God and ever wise Father. Jesus Christ. Lord, have mercy. Oh my God, if you got a prayer language, use it. Oh, something got to break in you. Oh, you got to get delivered from this puppet show. You're jealous over people in a puppet show. You're coveting people in a puppet show. Your heart is sick because things you don't have on the stage of the puppet show. This is ridiculous. Eternal God and ever wise for, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that this word would not fall on deaf ears. God, please let it land in the heart of good soil. God, please let it bear fruit. God, please, 30, 60, and 100 fold, deliver your sons and daughters from their love affair, their idolatry, their adultery with this puppet show. May they be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you, fulfilling their callings, the purposes that you have given them. And I pray, God, with every scripture, with every devotional, with every church gathering, their minds will be renewed 
Their hearts will be burned and stirred and that they would be transformed, metamorphism into a brand new creature day by day. I pray they will look up a year from now and meet a better version of themselves. That sometimes the next level is not a step up, it's a step into deeper surrender. And I pray, God, you would take these to the next level as we lay ourselves on your altar. I pray martyrs walk out of this room today. I pray they would resign from the puppet show. And I pray they will live as distinct men and women in an evil age for the glory of the one who saved us. And that is my prayer for them in the mighty and majestic and matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Victory Broadcast. We pray that message was a blessing to you. If you have a story or a testimony to share, we want to hear all about it. Send us an email to share at victorychurchatl.org or visit us online under share. Thanks for listening. Go in peace.